Uh, we're a little, a little bit late, but um, we are broadcasting. I think we're on Twitch. Jeremy, are we, we on are Twitch on right Twitch. now? We are on Twitch, punditing about video games. How appropriate. Yeah, we are. We actually are on Twitch uh, talking about Grand Theft Auto V and not basic income, poverty, and electoral politics, which is our typical theme. So, you know, we'll probably get to that. Um, we got two big shows coming up later in the day, so this is going to be kind of a warm-up for us. Uh, I got Sheridan, Jeremy are both here with me. Angelo's here, but I think he's idle. Uh, um, uh, maybe he'll come on. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, Sheridan and Jeremy are going to go ahead and start commenting on, on the news. Go ahead. Whoa, whoa. Let me uh, introduce myself as Sheridan. I'm at JSaberGamer on Twitter. And let's get the premise as me, who's been out of touch with the news for the past couple of days, and Jeremy, who's probably been in touch with the news for the past couple of days. <laughs> oh, shoot. All right, where do we start, then? Um, well, we can talk about how, well, Congress passed the uh, the HEROES Act. What was that? Was that on Friday last week? Wow, that was already a whole week away. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I think that was on Friday. Yeah, which is which is bound to die in the Senate. And I heard what, what, that uh, even if it does get through the Senate, the House already did some provisions in which recurring payments are not included. Correct. Yeah. So in, yeah. in this in this round of uh, round of legislation, the only uh, direct cash payments, other than um, unemployment extension, was another twelve hundred dollar check. Which was, uh, um, as far as I know, going to be identical to uh, what was passed in the, the first round of CARES legislation. Yeah, I've been paying attention to the news, trying to figure that out because I really, really need that money, like so many of us. Um, and it just seems like it's been just a repetition of the same story since uh, since it was passed last week by by Congress. It's like, okay, here's a, a couple tiny tweaks to the bill. Will it pass? Will it not? It's just the same commentators rehashing the same speculation, like almost literally every single day, all week. It's been that, and um, you know we're all on edge, wondering if uh, if it will pass, if it really is dead on arrival when it hits the Senate floor. Um, I don't know. I don't know when and if they're ever going to vote on it. You know, the the process is a little bit confusing and opaque. Um. Do you guys know when we might know when the Senate will um, kill the bill or not? Uh, it, it's they're not going to be back in formal session until June. Uh, so they 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 were in session, I believe it was Monday or Tuesday, but it was just to confirm um, a uh, I, I believe the um, inspector uh, some new inspector general position. I, I don't don't quote me on that, but they, they did reconvene just to confirm somebody into a position. Uh, yeah, but, they they. I read about that reconvening, but they are seriously not coming back for over half a month. That is over a thousand more dead bodies a day from people who could not shelter in place effectively. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, they're gonna uh, when they reconvene, the number is gonna be way over a hundred thousand. Maybe, man, in some dark dystopian way, maybe they're trying to use that as leverage. So when they get back, they can they can get in the pulpit and say. Over a hundred thousand dead, and we have we got our plan, and it's their plan that caused all these deaths. And it's I don't like know. if they're both going to use it as leverage against each other, with their you know they'll just frame it differently. Um, what's it matter? Why take the break anyway if it's just this elevating arms race? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. That's that's the problem. That's why the Cold War is so ridiculous. The the arms races don't make any sense. You don't need thousands of ridiculous statements for your ideology. This is just an utter waste of time in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But um, I'm curious to see what the Senate is going to, I mean, I'm sure this is Senate when they reconvene, they will propose something. I'm curious to see how it will compare to the, the heroes act. Cause it, you know, it's not, it's not impossible that what they propose would be superior to the heroes act. It's just, um, unfortunately it's uh, quite a ways away. Well, they could always completely replace the context of the Heroes Act and call it like the Senate Cares Act or something. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah which, which, the the, the first, buzz about. Oh, yeah, go on. I was going to say the, the first Cares Act, did that. I thought that passed the, uh, the Senate and then got sent back down to the House. Or did, or did that pass the House and go No, no, no. It, 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 
all of these uh, stimulus bills, anything that has to do with money will always come from the House. Oh, In the Constitution, the House is the um, basically uh, purse holder for the government. Nothing right. can it's- originate that has to do with finances outside of the House. Yeah. As soon as the words left my mouth, I, I realized, oh, shit, yeah, I remember listening to it live now. So I, <laughs> I was like, damn it. No, no. Thank you for bringing that up. Our, our audience may also be confused with the opaqueness of our government, and we should be very clear when we're discussing it. Yeah. So things that I think that the, the Senate legislation will, will uh, contain will be uh, hazard, well, hopefully, uh, will be uh, hazard pay for all essential workers. Uh, I think think it'll also Mitt Romney's uh, Patriot Pay program will have some aspects of that. Try to uh, implement it into it. What was that? Was there any conditions on that Patriot Pay again? So the what it boiled down to was essential workers would get a twelve dollar an hour raise, um, and it would be an opt in program from your employer. So your employer would have to pay three of those dollars, and there would be some. Um, like tax incentives that would, you know, take that weight off of the employer, such as a payroll tax holiday, which that pay, you know, that payroll tax holiday. When, when people talk about that, it talks, uh, what that means is you don't have to pay into, um, social security, um, uh, Medicaid, those types of programs from your, uh, from your HR. Yeah. <laughs> so when, I mean, the legislation in and of itself, for I mean, for for me and my wife, it would be um, huge. I mean, absolutely massive. Um, but what shies me away from it is when you start taking away funds from uh, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security. Those yeah, especially those since those, me. especially since the way that those programs are structured, those uh, taxes are directly paid to recipients, or nearly directly. For instance, uh, SSDI, 90% of the f- total funds go directly to recipients. And the uh, flow is actually pretty tight. As you've heard, the uh, fund itself is running rather low and can run out in a couple of years if it's not properly bolstered. And it's essentially straight from tax cuts into Social Security recipients. Or uh, from taxes, not from tax cuts. So sorry. Right, yeah. So it's already. I mean, we, everybody can see when the money runs out with Social Security right now. And it's not like it's not some ethereal possibility. It's it's a it's a inevitability right now. So to to further cut funds from it is yeah. I, I, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it. Is, is, is it is it the appropriate thing to do right now? Uh, well, considering that we are in, we are in unusual times, perhaps uh, some un, to be unusual, honest. I, I don't think it is because what we need is to bolster the vulnerable consumer community so that it's ready to re-engage with the market when we actually put down this uh, pandemic. But right now, we're having supply side issues. I can see why they're uh, thinking about tax cuts to make it cheaper on themselves. But ultimately, what's needed is unprecedented debt-driven stimulus. Right. It's also, I saw somebody. It, it, it was. It, it was not a uh, a congressperson or a senator. Uh, an idea of someone you you can draw five thousand from your social security now, and in return, you after you turn sixty five. Wow. How do you, yeah. It's, if, it's, if that's if that's actually really that possible, cool. that's that's um, really. Uh, that is really cruel and unfair because that could help so many people right out of college. That's ideologically repugnant. Yeah, I'll see if I can find that real quick. It seemed like an interesting thing. Like, like if it be, if you know if it became a thing, like would I do it? I don't know. Like social security to, to even be around by the time. No, I could no. Draw honestly, it, no. Maybe, I'd say yeah, so, I'd say we should get the news out and get people to cash out that five k now. Force the government to save the program. Right. It's like, I also don't ever see myself being able to retire anyway. So <laughs> I'll be working an extra an extra three months. Uh, I, I know, right? The best case, we have uh, climate change staved off 20 years, you know. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, what else has been in the news besides the HEROES Act and the Senate stalling? Uh, 
here. I'm so, sorry, guys. I'm just letting you know. I, I found a. I think I found one of the links here about the social security thing. I'll post that in the chat. Ah, oh, fantastic. It's not the original source that I uh, that I found it from, but yeah, they do speak on it a little bit. Oh wow, this is this is recently published. This is published today. Oh, this is really new and insidious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, huh. it's like it's like I, I don't. <laughs> I don't like it. Like I, I, I really fucking hate it. But push comes to shove, and yeah, I'm probably taking the money. Well, I mean, from you can take an accelerationist perspective and go, okay, well, you know, if we do make this program unviable, if we must cannibalize this program, you know, that will just the need. All those people this program serves, their need must just become energy behind a UBI. You know, if if Social Security isn't going to work anymore, a UBI might replace it. Yo, hey, so this is a. Uh... I'm not sure how his tweet is. This is from a guy named Matthew Gerald on Twitter. All right? It says, breaking, Andrew, Andrew Yang is being formally vetted for a high-ranking position in the Biden administration, even a VP, despite previous indications that Biden would choose a woman. Sources close to Biden say that possible. Yang has shown remarkable foresight. Yeah, 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 yeah. More lip service, more hearsay. I'll believe it when, like, anything irreversible happens. I'm done, like, responding to Biden pandering to the Yang gang just for our vote. We're not, you know, going to not going to vote until you give us our money. (laughs) This is also breaking from 30 minutes ago. This is a quote from Biden. If (laughs) it says, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. (laughs) <laughs> I think, oh. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that one <laughs> oh. well, uh, allow me to redirect our course back onto this stimulus this uh, $5,000 check I'm reading a little bit further down and it's uh, noting that it's a l- upfront $5,000 as a loan with a rate of 1 to 1.5% and that loan is 2 social security and that works out to be about 75 to about 120 dollars depending on the length of your loan and how compounding interest works on you so honestly that's a destitute and need that 5k to not just get through the next few months but maybe even get something that could make them i mean honestly i would try to put a little bit into it to improving the quality and uh, reach of this show probably at least getting some of the neediest of us microphones. Although if everyone's getting it, you guys can buy your own microphones, right? <laughs> I'm not sure how to <laughs> I don't even know how to put money into like improving the reach, but I'm sure I would do all kinds of things to improve my quality of life, perhaps sustainably, perhaps not with $5,000. I don't know. I think really I'd need, I would need uh, like a UBI of $1,300 a month and like a $5,000 jumpstart to really like have enough to plan with in a meaningful way, you know? But the thirteen hundred dollars a month would be great. I would just feel so much more secure, and I'd—I mean, I'd be able to plan a, a, to, to survive, but to plan to like grow and put money into a project, I would need both like a five thousand dollar Kickstart and a thirteen hundred dollar UBI to supplement my my current income of about one hundred dollars a month. Um, so that would be me. I would—I right, I think I would take it. I would take the loan. I mean, yeah. here's the thing. Also, there's a decent chance still of a debt jubilee in the near future. So. Go ahead, gamble on a loan. I mean, maybe that's irresponsible by common wisdom, but this is we live in absolutely ridiculous times, and, and, and you know, uh, common sense has led us astray, so let's try something else. Well, there's actually uh, two ways for debt to be solved for the next hundred years, and I've been thinking deeply about this. A debt jubilee is a great short-term way, but it you lose out on a lot of lenders and the word of economic stability and confidence it becomes shaky after a debt jubilee that's why economists are so concerned about it cuz they are normally in conjunction with massive government revolutions basically the previous government's debts are no longer void because there is no longer the previous government but uh in our current uh, situation with our complex global trade and global debt investments, uh, a debt jubilee just doesn't make feasible sense. What does make a little bit more feasible sense is a deflationary economy. And that, in, we've discussed a lot before, makes debt a, a natural because 
because the debt is also because your currency is con- yeah, which puts us in an interesting interesting position now. You know, is is a, is our is our currency going to inflate inflate or deflate? Um, you know, oh, it's or, deflating hella. Like, look around you. Look at how many sales are popping up. Bogo deals. How many? How much people want you to get products off their shelves and give you any kind of cash? They they, right. they just want any kind of cash right now. Right. Oh, no, yeah, no doubt. I mean, but that's how it is in the interim. Like, you know, is that how how long is that going to last? You know, is, it's I, probably I guess... going to last a few months, honestly, uh, because right. consumer confidence. I've uh, mentioned before, as shown by Gravity Payments data, has declined fifty percent in just one metro area in in Seattle a year. That is just not being spent. So. Yeah. That's a massive decrease, and we rely on the multiple. Uh, the multiple, ah, basically the principle of money multiplying as it's changed hands. So uh, if you pay a worker a thousand dollars, he's only going to save like twenty dollars and spend the other nine hundred. But if you give a rich person a thousand dollars, he's going to probably save eight hundred of it and then spend two hundred. That's the uh, income. Uh, multiplication di- difference, but there's obviously like, a lot more poor people that need to spend. <clears throat> uh, what else we got? Uh, we got who who just filed for bankruptcy? Uh, Pier One, Pier One is a uh, oh, finally, yes, yeah, the, no the big name, the big name bankruptcies. This this is the fun time. Yeah, so we got Pier One, we've got J.C. Penny. Uh, I'm I'm sure I'm blanking on some other ones too, but they have the <clears throat> the uh, the retail apocalypse is definitely gaining momentum now oh it's it's snowballing hard i think by the end of this year this year um the concept of a mall will no longer exist i 100 percent agree i think like outside of the like i mean certain certain malls like the mall nope. of america i think are, are, are gonna be like relatively the uh, mall of america has so much expenses right now if they even get a ppp if they don't get the forgiveness for it, they are gone. They are completely obliterated by expenditure. Yeah, potentially. I, mean, I was there. I mean, it's been two years since I've been there. I was, uh, I was working in the area and got to visit it. Um, and I was amazed at how I mean, it was thriving when I was there. Maybe, maybe things have changed in the two years. Um, I mean, the, the, the potential definitely exists. But it was the, the first time in a long time that I had gone, gone inside a mall and not just been greeted by mostly vacant shops. I completely agree. The Mall of America has great branding, but that was before the concept of pandemics was in the consumer mind. That's the main problem now. A perfectly timed cough from Jeremy, who I presume has turned away from the mic. Um, I'm trying. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> You're right. No, I want to cough now. See, it's, it's contagious. Um. <laughs> No, I, I think I think sharon has got a great point. Who in the world wants to go to a mall when brick and mortar was already on its last legs now? I mean, uh, we're all imagining, or at least, you know, the, the legacy media and the, the general narrative of the, of the culture leaders of the elite. Yeah, is, is there's, going to be, there's going to be a, a, a vaccine. We're planning on it. But why are we even so confident we can come up with one in two years? I mean, I mean, you know, two years is the is what is what many of the uh, elites think is like the conservative estimate, the most they could tolerate. Um, but man, come on, we haven't come up with a vaccine for the common cold ever, and this is uh, look, no less sophisticated than the common cold, is it? What are we doing? What well, are we doing? So the uh, vaccine that for the first and most lethal strain of coronavirus is proving effective in human trials right now, but you the regulations are going to forestall it another year. However... Yeah, that's um, the first strain. How many strains are there now? Four? I, honestly, there's been reports of over 30. There's been reports of a, a okay. six. Okay. So we nailed it, it here. It doesn't really uh, matter at this point. You need to contain the most contagious and most lethal versions. That's and all everyone- we need to do. And the minds of our planners and leaders are in this fictional, I mean, probably fictional future where in two years we got a vaccine and we go back to some semblance 
of the oh yeah the the v shaped recovery or the w shaped recovery there's no rubber band snapping after this there are jobs gone yeah there are jobs gone there is massive dislocation the consumer Mm -hmm. market is shaken and even international confidence in us has led to reduced investment so and the policy we, is crafted for a recovery that won't happen. All of the policy we're talking about is crafted for this V-shaped recovery because it is the only precedent that the government seems to know how to follow. Uh, go on, Sheridan. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a long tangent there. I don't mind. This is a very upsetting situation because the answer is obvious. We've been shouting it for months. You have to supercharge the consumership to stabilize themselves to regenerate their own confidence, which will leak into the international investment, which will leak into business investment, and the demand will drive itself. That's the most fundamental principle of economics that our leaders have forgotten, is demand driving itself if if there is currency to be traded with. It's it's as if there's been sort of a, a tacit attempt to legislate away the need for the market to operate with demand. You know, to oh, that's, sort of, that's yeah. actually, that's a beautiful, beautiful um, summarization of American welfare capitalism. The government is trying to subsidize and replace the free market mechanics that actually work, and they are also not helping. Right, and now what we have is like the test of this theoretical uh, system they've put in place through decades of legislation. And, you know, many of them didn't even think that it was going to work when they passed these laws, I believe. Um, perhaps some yeah. of them did. May, perhaps, who knows? But but it's certainly a theory that isn't coming together in practice. And they just don't have any plan of action that lets them reverse course. They can't go, looks like some of our ideology, most of our ideology, a lot of the things we based a lot of our career on was incorrect. Now, at the end of my life, I must embarrassingly change course. It's just, are they just like you? So, are they like, I just can't. My legacy demands I must stay the course for these last four years, three years, two years of my career. Is that what's going on? I mean, there's a lot of stuff at play. But. There is a lot of stuff at play, but I, I, I completely understand where you're going. Let's be a little specific. Like uh, Jacqueline, she has talked Uh, on at length about the flaws of our food stamp program that touches at the heart of the welfare misconception because food is one of the few markets that is truly market self-stabilizing life itself revolves around food we will fully eat food from the garbage if we need to it will get consumed properly unless There is severe distribution problems. For example, a farm dumping potatoes across the ground on its own farm. It's not getting anywhere and no one can get access to it. But uh, let's get back to the food stamps. They are a specified coupon for a limited basket of items. That fundamentally goes against the American capitalistic mindset of free choice through dollar distribution. It's ridiculous that there's even a basket or a limitation on this because food should be pretty uniformly understood as food, whether it's hot, made in a restaurant, or bought at a store. You know, one thing I've never thought about if, or considered is what, what, you know, what is the history of food stamps? When, you know, when, it, uh, when it was first introduced... And how was it implemented back then? Has you know has it gotten better? Or has it gotten worse since its since its implementation? Yeah, I think it was at one point literally stamps. You know, it's now SNAP or EBT. We still call it food stamps just because of cultural legacy. Um, well, yeah. I I believe it originated out of the first or second world war um, as a prototype when they did their rationing program for uh, food because everything was going to the war effort. Um, but after that, after the wars ended, the, uh, we had the reformation and that included food stamps for the destitute under FDR, I believe. Okay. So it was a new deal program. I believe so. Yes. Okay. All right. I think I actually comment on that, commented on that incorrectly once on a previous episode saying I did, I think I, I said it wasn't, I, I believed it wasn't. So, all right. 
I did not know it went back that long, but that makes sense. I'm sure there were like, you know, literal stamps then. That was oh, the tech I, we had. I, I know that it goes back that long. My grandfather yeah, yeah. Uh, preaches about how he was so destitute in college, he had to go on food stamps. And I'm like, I, I totally understand, grandfather. That was over 70 years ago. Yeah. And we like, have I mean, had a serious uh, development since then. <laughs> It's it's funny. It was like it's a it's a real like defining moment for him to have swallowed his pride and gone on food stamps. Because I remember when I was like, you know, I had my bachelor's degree. I had it for like three years, and I had no money. I just could not make men's could not make ends meet uh, living in New York City. And I uh, I I got food stamps, and it was not a big deal for me. I was just like, you know, going over my expenses and my bills. I'm like, I really can't make these ends meet. I have to figure something out. What are my options? What are my options? I'm like, oh yeah. Assistance, try that. Like, not for a minute was I like, oh, the shame. Oh no, you know. And this is like 2007. And, and that kind of that kind of touches <laughs> on the yeah. core failing of the American federal system in its current yeah. orientation. It is focused solely on GDP growth. That was not the focus before the Great Depression. The focus before the Great Depression was population growth, just as it always has been for the entirety of human history grow the tribe, have more members to do more things. It's one more mouth, but it's two more hands. And we've lost that to the dollar return figures as we try to create more sophisticated instruments to get even more profit. And that's not working anymore. We have to have a returning to population growth economics. Yeah, absolutely. And that is in so many different ways what Andrew Yang says. You know, it resonates with people because it's a very human it's a it's like a first principles primarily human message about like how to survive as a species how to i survive. agree and and it would and it's still embodied by a ubi the freedom a capitalistic allocation from the government to a person saying we know we're having this person we are accounting for this in our budget because we are a country with complete knowledge and complete freedom it would be such a powerful international statement. And it just seems like the only thing stopping this from happening, I mean, you know, like, what, about 70% approval among Repug- among Democrats, 51 or 53, depending? Oh, it's way are, higher now. It's, Republicans. I would, so, yeah, I would like, happily say over 60% across even the most hardlining conservatives. Okay, so yeah, at least 60%, if not perhaps three quarters of the nation are in support, bipartisan, nonpartisan support of this uh, more uh, of, of this perfect policy for this moment in time that that could could make the difference between an, uh, you know us entering another sort of dark age or not. Um, uh, you know, it will uh, absolutely be it will absolutely be worse than the Great Recession in yeah. physical it, human toll. But the stock market may not reflect it, and our government may not reflect it because it's only looking. Yeah. So, and that's the thing. There's no... At the stock market. There, and there's a very fundamental oh, reason no. that I the stock... I think there's a bit of a Discord, uh, Discord glitch where I wasn't, didn't hear you talking. But um, I was saying there's just no... So, so if their entire paradigm is the market, there's no market incentive for the people in charge of making the policy decision to fundamentally change our society in a way where we all have this basic income floor that would fix most of our problems at this moment in time or at least give us a chance to start fixing most of our problems stop the gridlock and the paralysis they won't do it because they have no incentive within their paradigm which is simply the market and simply their career you know they have no incentive the ones that want to do it have a have not lost touch with their basic humanity and their incentive comes from that i believe you know that's got to be where the the, the people who are in power who want to get this done that must be where they're their drive comes from unless they're cal- coldly calculating villains who think hmm this will stop them from burning my estate with pitchforks and torches you know but i mean i think very few i i think you know how many how many people even at the top where we select for sociopaths are sociopaths let's say 10 percent, okay but so most of the people who want ubi want it for a good reason i believe just by the numbers just generalizing you know um but we can't have it we can't have it because they're not a majority of the elites, of the people who make the real decisions. And it's just so frustrating. We have to incentivize them differently. Oh, we lost Sheridan. We lost Sheridan just when I was done talking. Dang How it. you doing, Jeremy? I'm doing quite well, man. 
Good, good. Excited to have uh, Scott Santons and Tim Ryan on the show later today in just a few hours. Uh, is is David Kim going to be joining too? I saw Hannah yes, talking yes. about Dave, it. David Kim. I told, uh, yeah, uh, David Kim is coming. I be- believe Heidi Briones is coming. Uh, Dan Larson's going to come probably. So, you know, I oh, invite shit. Them. So, yeah, it should be a nice, nice chat. I want to get these, I want to get our, our heads together and I want to say, Tim Ryan, thank you so much for coming. It's an honor. You know, you are a service and an asset to our cause. Um, Let's take this hour and strategize together. Let's talk about how we can work better as a more cohesive and effective coalition to get this done, to get UBI passed. Um, so, you know, let's all be respectful of sharing the time and, uh, let's get advice from the congressman and let's give some suggestions to the congressman on how he can effectively bring our ideas, you know, to, to the United States government. Uh, so good. I got, I got to say that now. Kind of got that worked out. Hopefully I'll say it again better in a few hours. <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> That's the plan. So, um. Yeah, and before that, we got Scott Sins. I guess with Scott, we'll just sort of have a more open QA, and I expect everyone has has a plan what they want to say to him. And Scott will stick around too, of course, for for Tim Ryan. And Scott will talk to Tim. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, we're gonna have some important discussion uh, that needs to be had. You know, at the, having Scott in the room is gonna make a huge difference. Uh, you know, as well as having a a sizable chunk of the UBI caucus in there too. Man, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I really hope, I really hope like a, a coalition um, forms or strengthens, and uh, we bridge some key communication gaps that help us get this thing done. So here's hoping. I'm kind of excited. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of where my head is. Like I'm trying to, I'm, you know, I'm trying to be here now. Um, but uh, I have not too terribly much to talk about because I'm just so so anticipatory for that at the moment. Um, what else is uh, what else is going on? Uh, Jack Jack Dorsey gave Humanity Forward five million. That's right. the uh, The founder of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, gave Humanity Forward five million dollars. Yeah. Uh, St. Louis native, shout out. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. not, not too many St. Louis natives make the news, uh, or at least not in uh, not in positive headlines. So I'll take this win. Yeah, I don't know. I've only had one. I've only been to St. Louis one time. It was for a wedding, and uh, you know, I had a nice time. But I don't know. <laughs> You don't get the real experience when you go someplace for a wedding. No. You're just like, yeah, you got good custard and good blues music. Nice. <laughs> um. Anyway, uh, should we should we just have a short show, wrap it up here, so we can all just prep? I think you know, talked about the news a little bit. Got to got to say some stuff we might not to today uh, with our bigger guest with the bigger room. So. Uh yeah, I'm 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 totally fine with it. All right, it's great. Well, thanks thanks for tuning in. Um. We're coming back today at two with Scott Santons for an hour, and then Scott Santons will stick around when Congressman Tim Ryan comes at three, all times Eastern. Tim Ryan will be here till four, and we'll have also um, Heidi Briones, Dan Larson, David Kim, uh, Hannah Wan, um, yeah, and a bunch of our, you know, hopefully all your favorites, all our regular, most of our regular speakers, I imagine, will attend probably this, our biggest yet episode. So I hope you'll come. Thank you for coming uh, to this one. If you checked it out, thank you for listening. And I will we'll hear from you again soon. You'll hear from us again soon, rather. Maybe we'll hear from you someday. There we go. You see, I'm, I'm just, I'm just all, I got, I got to go because I'm all focused on the future. So I, I will talk to you in the future. Goodbye. Stay safe out there. Bye. <laughs>